Thank you for attending our webinar today, The Impact of COVID-19 on Prisons. I'm Rayshawn Ray, I'm a David M. Rubenstein Fellow in the Governor's Studies Department here at the Brookings Institution. As we know, the incarcerated population is being hard hit by COVID-19. The infection rate in the Washington DC jail, for example, is 14 times higher than the general population of the city. In federal prisons, the infection rate is double the percentage of COVID-19 diagnoses in the general population. In Arkansas, about 40% of the states in a maximum security prison. In Ohio, about 20% of its COVID-19 diagnoses can be traced to one prison. Correctional staff are not immune. In Cook County, Illinois, nearly 200 correctional officers and about 400 jail detainees have tested positive for COVID-19. Lawmakers are facing pressures from criminal justice and civil rights organizations to provide better health care for incarcerated people and even release nonviolent offenders, those among the elderly and people in pretrial detention. What we're going to do today is explore what we've been calling the endemic within the pandemic. And of course, there are several of them. But what I want to do now is introduce my uh, esteemed panelists who are going to provide an overview of the scope of the impact of COVID-19 offer firsthand accounts of what the outbreak looks like, and then finally solutions and policy solutions on what we can do about it. I also wanna mention that we hope that you submit questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Viewers can submit questions for panelists by either emailing events at brookings.edu, that's events at brookings.edu, or hop on Twitter and use the hashtag COVID prisons or by tweeting brookingsgov. So I want to introduce each of our panelists. First, we have Marcus Bullock, who is the founder and CEO of Flick Shop. So he's going to be bringing a corporate perspective as well as the perspective of people who have been incarcerated. Um, our Brookings colleague, Annalise Goger, who is a David Rubenstein Fellow in Metropolitan Studies here at Brookings. And I should also note that Annalise will be heading up an event on June 5th that will essentially extend the conversation we're having to do it. Today, it'll focus specifically on getting a job after incarceration, thinking about that prison to work pipeline that we know is so critical for people after they leave incarcerated facilities. I'm also happy to welcome Mark Schindler, who is the executive director of the Justice Policy Institute. They've been doing a lot of work for a very long time in this space, and it's fortunate to have someone of his caliber on this panel. And then finally, Dr. S. Todd Geary, who is the Senior Vice President of the Rainbow Push Coalition, also a pastor, and will bring a myriad of perspectives as it relates to community as well as policy. Now, accordingly, I, it is my honor and privilege to introduce someone who doesn't necessarily need an introduction. He is a civil rights icon, the founder and president of the Rainbow Push Coalition, and made historic presidential runs in 1984 and 1988. We have the pleasure of having Reverend <coughs> Jackson give opening remarks for this event. Reverend Jackson. Good afternoon to all of you, especially to you, Dr. Rishon Ray, and these of you involved in this situation. Those of you are goodwill and human rights, we thank you so much. The COVID-19 epidemic has exposed something we've known for a long time. Those who didn't get free were those who were in prison. During the amendment said you free except those in prison, went the right way and do, they immediately began to build uh, prison farms, and begin to do private prisons, and the whole range of reasons why the gap is so great today between the free and non-free. The last four years have seen a rather, rather rise in prisons because prisons for profit has become a matter on, 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 on the stock exchange, which is humiliating to blacks and you know, embarrassing to whites, it seems. So, me, I want you to deal with today, if you don't mind. One is the, the impact of the antebellum days of slavery in the Civil War, the extension to the day, uh, the, the spread of the virus uh, is far worse than the general public. Uh, they, for a long time, they thought the issue was going to be the, uh, the nursing home, but behind those prison walls, people are uh, contacting the virus and the workers are getting sick and dying, and there are no cameras behind those walls to seem not to care. So there's a range of concerns I have there about this. I'm so glad you're doing this, and I want to thank you, Dr. Todd Yere, for your for working together on this. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Jackson. We really appreciate 
your comments and your time and being a part of this event. You noted several things that are extremely important that I hope that our panelists will talk about. I mean, from the historical legacy of convict leasing, which is something that people really have to focus on, which happened immediately after slavery and essentially became slavery by a second name as a lot of people talked about it. And of course, the fact that there are some prisons on the New York Stock Exchange, and particularly when we talk about private prisons, that'll definitely be something that we get to as well. What I wanna do is I wanna first turn it over to Mark at the outset to, to talk about these disparities. I mean, Reverend Jackson laid out the impact of these disparities. We highlighted some of the statistics and the way that they are impacting prisons in catastrophic uh, ways. So why do these disparities exist? And what are key issues that people should note? How should people think about disaggregating prisons uh, from other sorts of forms of incarceration? And here I'm really thinking about uh, issues that people brought up such as Professor Anna Spaulding from Emory University who's thinking about these issues as well as Francine Johnson who is a math teacher in Fayette County in the Fayette County school system as well as Donald Williamson who is a White House fellow and who are really trying to think through how we should really contextualize these disparities right now. Mark. Can you hear me? There we go. Yes. That's Thanks, Rashawn, very much. Uh, I want to thank you and Brookings for, for hosting this really important discussion. I'm, I'm honored to be joining you, Reverend Jackson, and, and such an impressive group of, of panelists today. Um, and in many ways, the, the answer to your question about why COVID-19 is ravaging through prisons and the related racial disparities that we're seeing is because, in essence, we have what I would describe as a perfect and indeed tragic storm where we have longstanding racially disparate impacts of the justice system in the US, and now COVID-19's disparate impact on people of color. So what we have is far too many high-risk, vulnerable people locked in small spaces, where it's almost impossible to contain the spread of the virus. The result is a public health and social justice crisis happening in real time. You know, most of the people who are watching today are probably familiar with the concept of mass incarceration. Uh, but for those that are, I just want to share a few data points to add to, to what you shared initially. Uh, since 1980 in this country, we've had almost a 500% increase in the number of people incarcerated, from about 200,000 to over 2 million people. And this resulted in America today having by far the highest incarceration rate in the world. We get very little positive impact on public safety, and many would say we've had the opposite impact. In fact, destabilizing communities and making us all less safe. This growth in incarceration has impacted people of color more harshly, and we see that across the board. African Americans incarcerated at five times the rate of whites. Latinos also very overrepresented. One in, one in three black men now expected to spend time in prison. That's compared to one in 17 white men. Close to two thirds of women in prison are women of color. And in fact, if African-Americans and Hispanics were incarcerated at the same, rights, the same rates as white, white people, we'd have prison and jail populations that would decline by almost 40%. Now I would submit that if these numbers were reversed, if whites, people who look like me were overrepresented in our jails and prisons, it would not be allowed to stand. Now, of course, the reasons for this mass incarceration are complex and include different policies and practices as it relates to policing and sentencing. But it's clear that both explicit and implicit bias, as well as institutional and structural racism, play a big role. Now on to COVID-19 which was initially called the great equalizer because we thought the, the spread would be in fact anyone and everyone. But now we're seeing that's not true, that it's hitting communities of color the hardest. And, and so why is this? Well, we know that people of color tend to have higher levels of chronic health conditions and are also more likely to live in higher density areas amongst other reasons. Notably, those are two things we see with incarcerated people. So what are we seeing in COVID-19 in jails and prisons? You presented some data at the outset, and I'll just add a couple of things. Uh, the most recent reports show that over 20,000 incarcerated people and over 5,000 staff have contracted the virus. And there's been over 300 deaths in total. Uh, we're seeing incarcerated people uh, infected at far higher rates uh, than the general population, 
And that's with very limited testing, right? I want to emphasize that very limited testing. We can talk more about that. In fact, where there's been widespread testing, we're seeing infection rates in jails and prisons as high as 70%. So I fear that we are seeing just the beginning of this crisis in jails and prisons coming into view. Um, I'll stop there. I look forward to the discussion, including talking about strategies to address these challenges. And, and I'll just reiterate that what we are seeing in terms of prisons and jails and COVID-19 is a public health and social justice crisis happening in real time. Yeah, Mark, thank you for that. I really like how you put social justice and public health crisis. And it's important for people to think about that. And I wanna bring in Marcus now, because I think it's important for us to get the perspective of what is it like during this time in prisons for incarcerated people? And this is building on some questions that we got from David Buchanan, as well as Elena Vanko from the Vera Institute, who are really thinking about is health even a priority under normal conditions? So let's just remove that the pandemic is going on. Is health even a priority under normal conditions in prisons? What does a lockdown uh, for a health crisis actually look like in prisons? What happens if the other person in your cell gets sick? I mean, is there a way to quarantine in prisons uh, without people being in solitary confinement? And Marcus, in answering this question, I hope what you'll do is provide us some insights into your own personal story, as well as the importance of your company, uh, Flick Shop, during this time. Yeah, no, thank you again. And thank you for having me on, on this um, on this panel, I think this is incredible. I love to see these kinds of conversations happening. Um, I lived in those cells for, for quite a bit some, uh, of time. Uh, when, when I was 15 years old, uh, I made a decision, stole a car from a guy, um, was certified as an adult as a 15 year old and sent to adult maximum security prisons for the next eight years of my life um, because I stole that car. Um, so, I mean, I spent all of my teen, you know, the rest of my teenage years and my early twenties um, growing up inside of a prison cell. And first, I think that it's, it's fair to acknowledge that my experience may be different from others as there's very little uniformity in the way that jails and prisons operate from state to state or even from state to federal facilities. And some facilities are they're even designed to explicitly pay more attention to people with health issues that place them at a typical higher risk of other people in, you know, in other populations. And so I'm hopeful at least for those facilities um, that they have very clear plans to deal with this kind of a crisis. Um, but the majority of the general population facilities, um, like the ones where I was housed, um, are focused more on the operation um, of the facility themselves and less about the actual well-being of the people that live there. Um, you know, I grew up in, in seeing as a teenager, you know, bodies get wheeled down the rec yard in a body bag in between count time with no one saying, oh, what happened, this was going on, like it was all in secret. And then all of a sudden, after a few days, you're like, oh, what happened to so-and-so? You know, you lock this whole wing down because they don't know what's going on and they don't want to keep everybody quiet because they want to keep, you know, so these are the things that you're, I grew up seeing. Um, the people who work in the kitchens, the education wings of the prison, the people who clean the rec yard, the people who even work in the medical units, they're all the residents, you know, the incarcerated people that live there. And even when there's a lockdown to try to contain some sort of breakout, the people who are delivering the food trays to my door, the people who are, you know, sometimes bringing some form of medication to the door. Again, these are the incarcerated residents that live there. And I can only imagine how scary it must feel to live in prison during this time where you can't contain it. It's, it's, it has to be a scary time. Yeah, Marcus, could, could you tell us about some of the ways that you think that people are trying to cope. So how do people cope in prison? I mean, and, and I, I think that some of the work that you're doing now uh, with your company, I think lends itself to that. So could you kind of talk about what you're seeing on this side in terms of the way that people on the outside are trying to connect with people on the inside and the impact that that has on, on, on incarcerated people? I mean, we all know that family engagement means everything, right? Like, you know, once we all leave from off of this, you know, panel today, like their, their families who are inside of our homes or at least on the other side of a Facebook post or other side of an Instagram post or another side of a text message or email that we may receive saying that we're okay. I'm okay. My mom is okay. Something's going on, right? Like this is major and we all acknowledge it as something that is necessary for us to be able to survive. Yet there are millions of people that are living in those cells right now who just don't have that luxury. 
And that's even scarier to think that not only do I have to live inside of an environment where I may contract something that will turn a two year sentence, a five year sentence, a three week sentence into a death sentence, that I'm also disconnected from my mother or my brother or my sister or my aunt or my best friend who's similarly going through something and want to share inside of this moment where we're all dealing with this level of anxiety. This is, a, again, I repeat, it's just a, a very scary time. And so we wanted to be able to not only help keep families connected during the journey before COVID, right? So Flick Shop, the Flick Shop app, uh, we built the technology to help keep families connected to their incarcerated loved ones. Take a picture, add some quick text, press in, hey baby, I'm okay. I just wanted to send you a picture of the kids dancing in the living room. And then we print that picture and text on a real tangible postcard. And we ship it to any person in any cell anywhere in the country because of the lack of a Facebook or Instagram or text messaging that you and I do every day. And we, if we believe that if we're being very intentional about building technologies, that scalable tech that is allowing folks to at least communicate during this tough time, um, then we at least relieve some of that anxiety that we're all feeling at home. Some of us a little bit more than others because we know that we have a loved one on the other side of that wall um, that potentially is being exposed to something that is, is really crippling our country. Mm. Yeah, Marcus, thank, thanks for that. And, and on that point, one of the things that you brought up was really thinking about spillover effects. And you talked about it in the context of being in prison, that there are people who work in prisons, who deliver food, who work in the educational facilities. But then we also know that there are people who come from the outside and who come to work at prisons, correctional officers, but there are also other people, other staff members who work at prisons and jails as well, who are then leaving, going home. So people like uh, Louisa David from Alternatives to Violence is interested in how transitions work. So what do people need to know? And I, I'm asking this question to Annalise, who I think has a lot of experience in this area with the transitions. What do people need to know about spillage beyond the walls and gates of prisons? And kind of thinking about this, we know that millions of people cycle in and out of jails and prisons every single year. Many inside and outside of correctional facilities are worried about the health and safety standards and protocols that are put in place. States like Ohio, Annalise, where you've done a lot of work as well as Arkansas, and then obviously DC where we talked about seem to be having trouble controlling COVID-19 outbreaks in prisons. Could you talk to us about the impacts of the spillage effects and spillovers as it relates to outside of the walls of prisons? Yes, sure. So. I think you're exactly right. I think both in terms of the people that are cycling through in pre-trial stages, um, all the way through to visitors, but also staff, you know, you can't just hermetically seal off a facility. And if you did, um, frankly, it would be a humanitarian crime in my view um, to, to try to lock everyone in there. Um, so you can't really think of these facilities as just being these closed off walls. Um, and one case that I'd like to, to draw people's attention to is the Marion Correctional Institution in Ohio. And um, back in, in late April, um, we were seeing more than 80% of the people who were incarcerated there had tested positive for COVID-19. And 177 uh, till now uh, have been tested positive as the staff members. And so those staff members are going home and their families are exposed and their community is exposed. And, um, you know, the actually Ohio had to bring in the National Guard to staff the prison because there were so many staff affected. There are about 2,500 um, people incarcerated in that facility. Um, so we're talking about 20, almost over 2,100 um, people who had tested positive and 13 have died. So uh, that's just one facility. Um, and if you look across the US, I looked last night at the New York Times, uh, what are the top counties in terms of the per capita cases? And five out of the top 10 counties were counties that had prisons in them. And four more of those were meatpacking facilities um, and poultry processing facilities. Um, so you, you, nine out of the 10 top counties of per capita cases are either prisons or meatpacking facilities. And I think we need to ask ourselves, what, who are, what is our um, value as a country if we don't pay attention to what's happening in these spaces and immediately intervene to make sure that the people inside are safe and the people outside are safe um, in these facilities. 
Mm. Annalise, that's a great point. When we think about these spillover effects, I mean, to your point, some of the, the huge increases we've seen in places, even say like South Dakota, for example, I mean, it's really thinking about the, these meatpacking plants. And of course, that has huge impacts on our economy long term, um, as well as in the short term. But these places also have prisons. So your point is that we're not thinking critically about this spillover effect from one place to, to another. I want to bring in Reverend Yeary now to talk about building on what Annalise said is where do we see the loopholes? So we received a series of questions from audience members about pretrial detention, uh, from Jobs for Life, Jobs in Four podcast, as well as Wyatt Detention Center, who are really thinking about pretrial detention, cash bail, um, how plea deals and broader forms of inequality that Mark highlighted at the beginning actually factor into who is in prisons and how these prison disparities are really felt in local communities. And here is thinking about building on what Annalise said, that we know that these sort of impacts after people leave prisons, not only are incarcerated people more likely to come back to, um, to minority communities, but also uh, we know that that people who work in prisons might be more likely to come back to certain types of communities. So how should people be thinking about um, all these sort of things together and the loopholes that are in the system that become important to think about? Um, for the question, first, the loophole, uh, <laughs> the, the, the word loophole has an interesting frame to it. It implies that there is an unintended uh, kind of uh, access and challenge uh, to a structure that would otherwise be uh, properly designed. And I would argue that this is really not a loophole. This mm -hmm. is actually the design of the system. It is intended to work just this way. So when Reverend Jackson raises the issue about tracking the trajectory and the history of the criminal justice system, we have to start with what the nature of policing was when policing was actually started. It was to protect white property interest and to reclaim uh, white property as uh, in the form of black bodies. And so starting from there, we already have a design that is intended to protect the monetary interest of a system that was supposed to promote free, uh, free labor. So when you come out of the 13th, with the 13th Amendment at the end of the Civil War, you have the exception that uh, slavery is outlawed except in instances of punishment for crime. You now have a new plantation. That new plantation is called the prison system. And so as we continue to work through this, we have to remember this is not a loophole. It's really the challenge of needing to go back and start afresh with a redesign of a system that is actually achieving what is it is intended to do. One in three black males are gonna have some contact with the criminal justice system in their lifetime. And then you've talked about it, you mentioned bail. Some folks get free, other folks get a bill. You have to pay for your liberty depending on who you are. And so if we look at it, even at the federal level, Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen, they're going home. But if your name is Johnson Jones Smith, or some other common name and you come from uh, an at-risk or a high-risk census tract, you're still there almost held captive, not only by a system that won't let you out because you're poor, but that you're, th you're then being further penalized because of your poverty. And then the third thing that's not a loophole, it is a design. It is a loss of confidence uh, in the court system itself. Uh, most of us who've gone to law school recognize that we're taught that the uh, most obvious and egregious ruling that has ever come from the Supreme Court is the Dred Scott decision. But just because you change the meaning of the decision does not mean you've changed the system that the decision was speaking to. And so we've lost our confidence in courts where judges come unqualified and unaware to even talk about the instances and the conditions that say I'm criminalized because I'm poor. And so in New York City, if you're white, you get a mask. If you are black and not socially distancing, you get a record. And so it's not a loophole, except when we're able to say we did not intend for the system to be designed this way. But when this is operating the way the system planned for it, it's not a loophole. It's still a problem that we've got to go all the way back to the foundation and rebuild a system that is based on the highest principles of human rights across the world. Yeah, Reverend Yeary, great points. Let, let's bring in Reverend Jackson who, who has some remarks to make on, on what everyone just said. 
Rick, I'm concerned that Cook County Jail has 9,000 pretrial detainees, 9,000. Mm. About 3,000 of that, they're not anxious to get out because it's become a jail hotel. They're homeless. Mm. But through the mental challenge, they take medicine all day and sleep, a third of them can't afford to get out. The other thing is they, they ship them away from downstate, rural areas, where you get your 500 cell jail, your Walmart, you build a whole town around the jail. So that's a best interest in keeping the jail open uh, because of the profit in, in prisons. And then lastly, the impact, they also count those people in their, in their revenue sharing scheme. They can't vote down there, but they're counted as part of revenue. So that's why it's, revenue, it's not a loophole, it, it's the whole itself. I mean, I think that's exactly right. And the points you all brought up, um, it's important for people to know when we talk about convict leasing, which was where black people would be picked up for very small infractions in the late 1800s after, after slavery and the Civil War, some, a lot of those practices have continued, but what's key is the impact that these types of incarceration <clears throat> practices had on local economies. Let's take the state of Alabama, for example. So when Reverend Jackson says people are being shipped up north, that's part of a practice that still exists. In the late 1800s, convict leasing accounted for about 75% of Alabama state revenue, 75%. So part of it is really thinking about that incarceration and incarcerating particularly people of color is something that's profitable for people who don't look like those people of color. And so accordingly, what I wanna do now, let's, let's take a, a pivot. I think we've laid out some of the key issues that play out. Now let's talk about solutions. What I wanna do, we're gonna kind of backtrack where we went. So we're, it's like mm -hmm. fantasy football drafting. So I'm gonna start back with Reverend Yeary. And, and you laid out a series of, of just pivotably important things and how you highlight these aren't really loop, loopholes, but things are designed to be that way. And you essentially asserted that maybe we need to think about a complete restructuring of how we think about the prison industrial complex, if you might say it that way. So could you kind of build on that and talk about what solutions you see that, uh, that, that, that you think can really change some of the disparities in, in, the, prison, in the prison system? Oh, you muted. Okay. We got it now. All right, good deal. Right. Let, let, let's start with constitutional policing as a baseline. Uh, Baltimore City currently is under a consent decree with the Department of Justice because of some of the most egregious policing practices going back to the death of Freddie Gray five years ago. What we don't often talk about in framing the conversation around Freddie Gray is Freddie Gray is from the neighborhood that when you do a neighborhood analysis, it has the highest number of black men who have been taken out of the community and caught up in the criminal justice system of any other neighborhood in the state. And so what you have then are these problematic instances where uh, we, we, we see the, uh, the reinforcement of bad behavior, bad policy, bad practice, and there's not enough uh, in enforcement on corrective action. So we got to start with constitutional policing. The second thing is we got to get rid of money bail. I should not, if the state has not met its burden uh, to convict me beyond a reasonable doubt before a jury of my peers for a criminal conviction, then I should not have to pay my way out of jail. This It's like monopoly. We shouldn't have to just hope to get past go collect $200, land on chance, get a get out of jail free card and hope we don't get jammed up in the process. We've got to make sure that the burden is, it remains where the burden should always be on the state and not on the individual to prove that they're not guilty because the presumption is that they are guilty. And then we got to watch judicial appointment and at large election for judges to state courts across the country. Because when you dilute the voting power of folks and oh, by the way, if I'm in pretrial detention, I still have the right to vote. My voting rights have not been lost. How do we make sure that the citizenship right, which is no less than the franchise itself, is protected and preserved while the government decides what it must do? Don't put me in a corner, strip me of my rights, and then say, let's make a deal. That's not a deal. Uh, that is a coercive effect that says I'm always going to uh, negotiate against my best interest. And in, in criminal justice, as in Vegas, the, you never bet against the house because the house is always gonna win unless you change the system from the bottom up. 
Yeah, that great points. I, I want to bring in Annalise and Marcus. And what, what I hope that you all can talk to is where do we see potentially some, some positive outcomes? I mean, of course, you can talk about the solutions. Um, I know that Annalise has definitely some. We're going to go to her first and go to Marcus. But I also want to think about what are some positive outcomes either around the country in the pipeline that can be replicated. I mean, here I'm kind of thinking about uh, prison to work programs and research that's being done, prison education. I mean, we had a series of questions from um, Asha uh, Marshy, as well as Irene Oyuko from, the, from Clean Star Kenya, who's really worried about prison education. Is that a place where we see some positives or are there still some issues there? So Annalise, how about you go first? I think particularly you telling us about some of the work you've been doing in Ohio would be really important. And then Marcus, I think if you can also talk about prison education um, that you potentially participated in, but then also what are the shortfalls of that and how you see prison ed education moving forward into the 21st century in prisons. So Annalise. Yeah, and I, well, first I wanna highlight something that Marcus uh, said, which is that, you know, education within facilities varies tremendously, um, both in terms of based on who is governing that facility, but also the types of community organizations that surround it. Um, so, you know, I think that's a big challenge um, when you're thinking about trying to reform something quickly in a crisis, which I really think we should pay attention to. Um, uh, but yeah, to, to get to your question, uh, so um, several years ago, um, under the Obama administration, they created a series of grants called the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College Career Training Grants. That's an acronym called TACT. Um, and uh, what this did was it gave money to community colleges to provide um, training that's really geared towards adult learners in the aftermath of the recession. And so the idea here was to experiment and pilot and see what works based on some promising practices. So in addition to uh, providing training in more flexible formats and stackable formats, they also provided career counseling that uh, where somebody had a career navigator that they could work with carefully. Um, and then the third component that's really important is a strong connection to employers and, and work-based experiences. Um, and I was lucky enough to be one of the evaluators of a TAC grant that um, was funded in Ohio. And I was talking about Ohio earlier and, and very close to the Marion County area um, is North Central State College where they actually, as part of their TAC grant, they developed a bridge program. So the, uh, the idea is that it's, it's meant for all adults, but it helps them transition into community college. Um, and into employment. And in theirs, they partner directly with their court system. As you all probably know, we have a, an opioid epidemic as well as a coronavirus epidemic. And the highest rate, um, the highest reason, the most common reason people are incarcerated in Ohio is because of drug offenses. And um, so in that area in particular, um, they were seeing a lot of people coming out of the court system uh, who need a job. So they used the TAC grant to provide that case management and co career coaching carefully with those folks. And we saw um, that the people uh, a, a, at quarter four after the start of the program, a year after the program, um, compared to the regular WIOA adult and dislocated worker program folks who were not getting training, but were just getting the career coaching through that program, compared to them, they were employed at 30% higher rates uh, mm -hmm. a, after a year. And, um, overall about 60% of them were still employed. And so uh, my concern is that, you know, in this discussion about what do we do about all the layoffs and, and um, not just um, uh, prison to employment, but any adult that's trying to um, transition into another career is that we're talking about doing another round of tact or another round of experiments. And my question is, why don't we take um, cases like this where we saw success and we, we already know that TAC was designed based on promising practices and evidence. So if we know what's working, I think we need to scale it. And, and what we need is um, we need permanent funding streams for accessible training where someone can be working while they're being trained and they're getting that work experience and getting a foot in the door. I think that's really the one of the big system changes 
that is good, not just for people coming out of incarceration, but really for any adult that, um, that is in a low wage job or just uh, needs to transition their career. Yeah, and at least great points. Marcus, do you want to build on this? We know that FlickShop has a uh, FlickShop School of Business. I, I'm, we're hoping that you can tell us about that as well as uh, build on what, what Annalise was talking about, about the effectiveness of these programs. It seems that once they're in place and people are actually able to use them and connect it with employers, they work very well. And we know that FlickShop has helped to, op helped to function uh, for this pipeline from prison to work. So could you tell us about your experience and the work that you've been doing? Uh, oh, hold on, hold on. We got well, I, got, I got too hype. I got too hype. I was on mute. This, <laughs> this makes me really excited to hear Annalise's talk, comments talking about, you know, the programming and the value of it inside of these facilities. I mean, I mean, we're really excited about leveraging our existing technology at FlickShop to help keep families connected while they're, while they have incarcerated loved ones. And um, as research points to family engagement being the largest contributor to success after prison, we're also excited about helping businesses announce their job opportunities or their fair chance hiring practices that lead to immediate housing once someone is released on our little micro postcards. These are just some of the ways that we're able to see <clears throat> technology um, be able to contribute to reducing recidivism as that's our key metric for, uh, for success here at FlickShop, right? Like how many people are we helping to prevent going back into those revolving doors? Um, but I think that one of the things that, I mean, I'm a living a testament of how the value of a program inside of a prison can completely change the trajectory of success after prison. It was only because of a business software computer applications class that was in prison that didn't even have internet access when I was still using Windows 95, trying to figure out how to navigate between a DOS prompt and using a mouse that allowed me to be able to have some sense of comfortability and familiarity with the technology. So that when I came home, because I went to prison, there was no internet. I came home, it was Google, right? And so, you know, you, you come home and you face all of these barriers with a, a high expectation for success when you leave. In fact, probation officers, they mandate you to be successful. You have to get a job. You have to do these things the moment that you get out of prison, right? And so we wanted to figure out how to be able to do this um, at scale and, and help reduce these levels of um, recidivism at scale across the country. And so we built the Flick Shop School of Business that takes our story of, you know, from prison to entrepreneurship back into a very unique uh, uh, curriculum into these facilities to help educate the men and women that are going to be coming home to say, hey, listen, this is what it really takes to be able to come home and succeed, right? Like, it's not enough to say, in theory, like, just don't, you know, stay out of trouble, go get a job. Like, these aren't real practical, real solutions that allow for the people sitting in the sales to be able to have any level of potential success after prison. Um, and, and now as we think about what it's going to take in order to be able to take this kinds of core messaging and deliver them into, you know, thousands of facilities around the country, we're taking virtual reality uh, to, into these sales where we're bringing these kinds of same programs and environments that were typically only reserved for a classroom at a college or university back into these sales and say, hey, look, the, the, the talent is equally distributed in these sales. It's just the access that is not. How do we begin to bring access to the same levels of technology that are going to allow for our, my cousin and my children and my best friends to succeed when they graduate? You know, unfortunately, not going to graduate this month, but, you know, it's going to be some online thing I think they're going to do. Right. But how do we bring that to these sales? Right. Because they are just as deserving. And we're excited about leveraging scalable tech to do that. Mm. Great point. So I want to bring Mark in here because I know that the Justice Policy Institute has been working in the solution space. I mean, for a very, very long time. And I think you can tell us about some of the uh, wins and successes that people might think about in these spaces that's important for people to think about. Because I think we always think about, all right, things are so bad now. But I think it also becomes important to think about how bad it, it potentially once was and what progress has been made. And I also hope that you can talk about some of the ways that grassroots activism has been operating. And so there were a couple questions related to that. Uh, Jessica Frank had a question about that. Richard Robinson from the Department of State wanted to know the ways that prisons are working with local hospitals and medical facilities. So really, can you just talk about what's happening on the ground, solutions and the various ways that people should think about change in this space? Yeah, absolutely, Rashawn. And thanks. So much. I mean, this conversation is really amazing from Reverend Jackson's comments and Reverend Yeri's to, 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 to Marcus and Annalise. There's so much there and so much we could cover. Um, I, I wanna go back just for a second to where we started, 
right? And the reality is, is that we have just far too many people in this country in cages, right? Particularly black and brown folks, right? And so, so I would suggest as we think about these, these issues that we, we put forward and we demand from, from elected officials, from policymakers, that anything that they do pass a, a three-part test, right? And that three-part test would be, is it effective? You're hearing some of the things that, that Marcus and Annalise are talking about. Is it fair, right? We've heard you know, what, what Rev, the reverends are talking about in terms of how these, these policies hit communities of color and whether it's safe, right? And right now, what we know, even on its best day, prison, and jails are not safe places. Now, people who have gone there are essentially have been sentenced to death, right? So, so locking up so many people, not investing in effective uh, uh, responses uh, fails all these tests, right? Um, in terms of what we're seeing happening right now, uh, th there's, there's some, some good things happening, right? Uh, and we should think about how that, that gets sustained. Uh, on the on the pretrial side, people who haven't been convicted in, in our jails around the country, we actually have seen a, a fairly substantial reduction in populations, about 30 percent. Right. Um, I was having a conversation just just yesterday with a reporter uh, in California who was saying he was talking to local law enforcement who said, you know, we have to enforce the law. We have to take these people to jail. And he pressed him a little bit and he said, well, you know, we've got somebody that they're, they're, they're disorderly, they're drinking, and perhaps they may be a threat to safety, to public safety. Well, that's absolutely the wrong standard for why somebody should be incarcerated, should be locked up, right? In normal times, we shouldn't be putting people uh, in locked places unless they are a substantial threat to public safety, right? In these times, absolutely, we should be doing everything we can to keep people out of these incarceral settings, right? Because it is so dangerous right now. Um, I think we are seeing, I think some of the reductions in the jail populations, quite frankly, I think because is because of activism going on on the grassroots level that tends to be more in urban centers, right? As Reverend Jackson said, our state prisons tend to be far away from cities and they're in rural areas. You're not going to see a lot of grassroots activism in those places because organizations and people are not located there who are engaged on these issues. So I think some of the jail reductions, I think, probably are a result of some of the activism. The last thing I'll say in terms of some successes, um, of course, this is an issue for youth facilities as well and young people, right? A little known fact is that uh, over the last 10 to 12 years, the number of youth incarcerated has declined over 50%. Most people don't know that. They're, and juvenile crime has continued to go down, right? During this pandemic, youth detention pretrial has also gone down substantially. We should be sustaining those reforms, right? We should be pushing people to say, if it's not effective, if it's not fair, and it's not safe, we shouldn't be doing it. And incarceration, what we know about incarceration is it's the most expensive, least effective, and most unfair response. Reverend Sean. Jackson and, and um, Annalise in here to talk on these points. Reverend Jackson, go ahead. One of my concerns that we have in Cook County in Illinois, those pretrial detainees, we have put polls in the jail. We register them to vote. In, in their citizenship, selling to crack the jail opioid to go to uh, go to the hospital, that, that distinction. Most of the furniture in, in, the, in the federal government and states are made by prisoners. They make the furniture. They come out and they can't get a job in the furniture company. Now, I was, I was the last that the, those young people should have uh, computers and learn apps and codes and programming. They can't get a job, they're less likely to be recidivists. I mean, that's great points. And so the points you just brought up, we got a series of questions. And I know Annalise is uh, about to build on these points, um, but I'll just throw some things out there for, for, for the panelists to think about. And Mark was bringing it up, Reverend Jackson was thinking of bringing it up, is how we think about private 
versus public facilities, how we think about youth facilities, how we think about jails versus prisons. I think these are the types of questions that people are trying to figure out. So Annalise, go ahead and then I'll kind of bring up uh, another set of questions. Sure, I think uh, the Reverend Jackson and Mark brought some really good points up. I think definitely there's, a st there's strong evidence that if someone can get a job, then they're less likely to um, go back into incarceration. So it's in everyone's benefit to help people get jobs. And you know, I think one of the big barriers we have is on the employer side when you're when you don't have restrictions on on blanket, um, you know, criminal background checks where just any background at all eliminates you from the position. Um, there's a company called Checker that we've been partnering with uh, my previous job. Um, that has a capacity for the employer to say when they post the job, you know, these types of records aren't good for this job, but these are okay. And I think there's strategies that you can do as an employer to, um, to, to give people a fair shot when they're coming out and after they have served their time. Another issue that I think is really important to think about after this, uh, in the midst of this crisis, is that a lot of times when someone is, uh, has been in for a long time, they're released into congregate housing. And those facilities also uh, are not ideal to release people into in this crisis. So I think it's a high priority to release as many people as we can. But we have to think about in this moment, A, this person is gonna have a harder time finding safe housing. Um, they're gonna have a harder time getting a job in this job market. Um, and, and what can we do? Um, you know, to increase the supports that are available um, and, and do so in a way that's more even and not just sort of sporadic based on who happens to live in an area that has a lot of organizations nearby. Rashawn. Yes, sir. The, the point, a uh, number of people I've met in prison taken off of jobs, locked up for lack of child support. Keep on job, garnish the checks. The lock them up is to pay, the imprison them, and be the family of the, of the, of the maid who's in prison. If, if you take it put off the job and then uh, lock them up, keep on the job and go under their checks and pay child support in that way. So we have an, a, an appetite for lock, locking people up. You know, I think these are great points because it really talks about, and we got some questions about nonviolent versus violent offenders. You know, I think there are a lot of people who, people who are incarcerated and they instantly think these are people who are in jail for overly violent crimes when most people overwhelmingly are in, are in prisons and jails where that's not the case. So I want to throw out a series of questions to the panelists. You all feel free to answer how you may. So Reverend Year, you feel free to kick it off and Marcus, you, you all go. So we got a question from John that asked, should Attorney General Barr temporarily suspend operations by federal prisons industry? So FPI, we know employs federal prisoners inside BOP prison run factories. I think Reverend Jackson was just talking about that when we think about furniture being made. I know at universities, if you look, actually look at the furniture that's made in universities and the desk that's made in universities, oftentimes this furniture is being made by people in prisons. That's something that people don't necessarily know. The next set of questions from Gene, Daniel, and Elliot really kind of talk about who should be making decisions about who stays and who goes. So Gene says that Virginia is releasing inmates due to deaths and illnesses in prisons. But on the other hand, uh, we also know that in some cases that's not happening. So Daniel's wondering is what practical steps can be taken to minimize trans trans transmission and a reduction of staff and inmates when that's not necessarily an option. So in other words, what he's asking is, what do we do to kind of prevent the spread from people who are coming into prisons? What they say is you're supposed to stay home and self-quarantine, they can't do that. So what does that look like from a practical standpoint to deal with that? And then finally, how do we really juxtapose this public and private divide between public run facilities, private run facilities, as well as the differences between jails and prisons? So I know I threw a lot out there. Mm -hmm. but I think you can kind of handle that. I think, I think Reverend, Reverend Yeri can. So go ahead and take the first stab. Uh, uh, yeah, you, 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 you threw it to me, and uh, my leader is chuckling in the background. So you wait to see this what this response is going to be. Let, let, let's kind of start with uh, the, the suspending of operations uh, for, for working inmates, right? So if you're outside the walls and the executive order has shut down your business, 
federal legislation made it possible for you to apply for unemployment insurance pending your ability to return to work. Why don't we have the same kind of consideration for workers behind the walls? What we've done is we've created this bifurcated system that somehow or other we are given the latitude to deny full human rights to folks who are incarcerated and that's problematic. So I think that's one, what, look, if you can do it on the outside, you can find a way to do it inside, which includes testing, depopulating, uh, how do you get there? Who makes the decision? It depends on where they are in the process. If they're pretrial, that could be the district attorney or the state's attorney. Many times folks are being held subject to trial because they're overcharged because 97% of convictions in state courts come by way of plea bargain. So if I'm already overcharged and my back is against the wall, sure, I'm gonna take what looks like a deal because I either want to shorten the amount of time I might be gone or to get out sooner, even though I cannot afford to get out now. Parole boards have to be activated. Governors have to use their executive authority because state courts fall under the executive branches. And then sometimes you actually have to have litigation. You're gonna to have to go to court. And if we don't create a new line of test cases to protect the rights of persons to begin to change how laws are interpreted and applied depending on zip code or race or gender, whatever the case may be, then what we're doing is we're basically adapting to a process that is already flawed uh, from its inception. So that's my quick flyover. And uh, but you, I'm, but I'm right. yeah, my point, and, and many of the people like Marcus can't, can't get a Pell Grant scholarship, uh, can't live in public housing. They're, they're locked up while out of prison. It's, it's, it's a program for recidivism, punishment beyond the walls. Yeah, and the, the recidivism piece, what we know, a couple of things, right? You can use risk assessments if that's necessary, because really the issue of pretrial is are you going to show up for trial? It's not, or if you're a threat to the community. So if you can't establish those two, then you really should be released on recognizance. Uh, but the other piece is, is that the ability to find a job, here's the big deal. Uh, we often uh, point to the data that says the greatest predictor of returning to prison is can we keep folks employed once they get out? But under the CARES Act, if we had someone who has returned to the community, started their own business, been in business under five years, they are actually precluded from accessing the CARES Act funds. It's fundamentally unfair. I believe that if we got folks employed on the front end, we might not have such a need for prisons at all. And bottom line, if they trade on the stock exchange, they should not be in the business of holding bodies. That's nothing less than modernization of the slave system itself. I wanna get other people's thoughts on this point that Reverend Yeary just brought up. So let's go to Marcus, we'll go to Mark and Annalise's thoughts about private and public. So Reverend Yeary essentially just brought up what it looks like to be on the New York Stock Exchange and literally be able to profit kind of doubly over. What are you all's thoughts about this? And in addition to this central issue, what are other uh, differences that people should be, that, that people should know about public versus private and prisons versus jails? So Marcus, we'll start with you and go around the horn. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, I'm probably one of the I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that I was probably one of the only ones to live in both a private and a prison and a, um, and a state-ran uh, facility. <laughs> and uh, you know, very, very um, interesting experience. I mean, I'll tell you, when I was in prison, the reality of it is, is that you know, I care about it a lot more now because I think about the lobbying that potentially may be happening as a result of incarcerated bodies going inside of the cells. But then, back then, I wasn't thinking about whether or not this was a private facility or, you know, or a state-run facility. They were all prisons to me. They all looked the same. They all operated the same. One may have had a little bit more, um, you know, a few more perks like a larger screen TV or a, a, a fan <laughs> kind of purchase inside of my sweaty wall, when, you know, cell. But for the, for the most part, like these, a prison was a prison, right? And so, at first, I just want to kind of sort of acknowledge, like, I don't know if the fight is so much as like, you know, with the, you know, how the, the operations of them work, because, you know, if, if most of them do the research, we'll find out that the, 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 the vast majority of, of prisons in any state are all state ran facilities, a very small fraction of them are all private. The problem here is, are people, are, are we experiencing folks going down and lobbying to in Washington, D.C. and saying, hey, we need to incarcerate more bodies because we love <laughs> beds that we already have paid for. 
One of the other things that I think is really important, we teased out a little bit, is this conversation around violent versus nonviolent offenders and then the, the access um, to, to programming and or uh, potential releases as a result of what the case was. And the reason why, the reason why I love that I see, get to have the opportunity to be able to sit on panels like this is because I want to be one of the ones that, do, that represent a statistic and just not a statistic. I want to humanize that experience, right? We typically talk about data, but very seldom do we have the opportunity to be able to meet one of those people. So when I committed my crime back in December in 1996, I, I, I walked up on a guy, my friend and I was 15, he was 16. We both pulled out a gun on a guy, asked him to step out of his car and drove and jumped into his car and drove off, right? Now that became, because we used a gun, that became a violent offense. And while I'm so grateful to God that no one got hurt in that night, but an hour, just an hour later, that same Marcus was in a car smoking weed with his friends. Now, if I got, would have gotten caught an hour ahead of time, I would have been a nonviolent offender who would have had more access to opportunity during the incarceration and even post-incarceration than the same Marcus that sits before you today that Reverend Jackson just pointed out that I can't go rent an apartment in most neighborhoods. I won't be able to sit on the HOA inside of my own neighborhood. I can't coach my son's basketball team. I can't do some of these same things that we all enjoy as civil liberties once you're supposed to come home. And, 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 and that's frustrating. And so I want to eliminate that argument around violent versus not violent and who's worthy enough for that kind of redemption. Um, and so I think it's important to, to, to mention that. When you, when you have Paul Manafort and Cohen and Flynn flaunting the law, how does it feel locked up since these guys are too, too good to be locked up? Some years ago, it just looked at a very attractive young blonde lady. He said, she's too beautiful to be in jail. He, he would lock her up. The judge dismissed her case. She's too beautiful to be in jail. And, and now you got Paul Manafort and Cohen and Flynn about to be freed and people, they're flaunting the law. Mm. Yeah, I want to get Mark and Annalise in on this point. Go. Why don't you go ahead? I was going to talk about the private setting. And I think mm -hmm. what many people, what I know of is um, talking to formerly incarcerated folks who live in the congregate housing I was talking about. And I just wanted to share a little bit about that. So that was owned by one of the private prison companies. And he had been receiving a tech training that in, within uh, before he was released and was looking for a tech job. They tried to institute a rule saying that no one in the house could have any tech, anything um, worth more than $200 within the house. So here's a person who is supposed to be looking for a job in tech that can't get an iPhone or a laptop. And so he had to fight back against these rules within the congregate housing. Um, and then secondly, they were garnishing wages. And, and so I think that the, the point here is you know, there's a profit incentive for, to keep people in that setting longer. And there's not really a lot of check and balance in terms of, you know, are we, are all the rules in that house helping that person get a job? Are all the rules in that house helping that person, you know, can restart their life? You know, is that person uh, experiencing, um, you know, any, any, um, any factors like curfews that are keeping them from getting jobs and getting and being productive in society. I think, you know, that's one of my uh, concerns about private governance is that that gets into these gray areas that nobody uh, is paying attention to. Mm. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, so if I could just jump in, I know we're getting close on time and I'll, I'll go back to something Marcus was talking about in this, this violent, nonviolent dichotomy which I think is really um, an important thing that's going on right now in terms of the COVID crisis, right? Uh, most uh, states to the extent uh, and jurisdictions to the extent they are talking about releasing people, uh, they're, they're limiting it to nonviolent, right? Um, nonviolent offenders. And we have to get past uh, the, the <laughs> offense and look at the risk level that people pose. And so for example, today, we have a substantial number of elderly people in prison because of the long sentences that have been imposed since the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, right? Th these are people who, by and large, went into prison for violent offenses, right? Um, whether they're high risk then or not, let's put that aside. They went in for violent offenses. But today, what we know, because of their age, is they are at the lowest risk to reoffend but they are high risk in one way. They are an extraordinarily high risk uh, to COVID-19 and to yeah. die, right? Uh, 
And so we have to get, we have to put aside this violent, nonviolent and look at risk level, right? Essentially what we have in our prisons, it was mentioned earlier about other congregate care facilities. I think Reverend Jackson was talking about nursing homes, right? In our prisons, we essentially have very expensive nursing homes because we have a very elderly population that has grown enormously. We should be looking today at those people and making sure that they can be released with good plans, right? It'd be much more effective to, to rent hotel rooms and keep them socially distanced than keep them in, in, in what is essentially a Petri dish uh, in, in our prisons. And so I think we need to really push the envelope and have uh, more informed discussions about this violent, nonviolent piece moving forward. Dr. Ray Sean, since this thing has been driven by the pandemic, uh, we have a certain sympathy toward nursing homes, these are our grandparents and the like. But the fact is the most dangerous thing is behind the prison walls. Some jailers will not let the press in. You know who's dying behind those walls. And and, and Cook County Jail had 400 inmates positive, 400 workers positive, and workers are dying. They, they work three hours, eight hours shifts, they come out of, and they go home, they spread it. So the a source of spreading this thing now is coming from workers who work three shifts in jail every day. Yeah, I wanna have you all real quickly reflect on a central question. And, and I know, Mike, we couldn't even get to um, the, the great question you asked about ICE detention centers and the way that we kind of see medical neglect. But what I wanna ask each of the panelists to reflect on is, is Gene's questions about who should be making the decision about who stays in prisons and who goes home. And I'm thinking about Susan Farrell, who was 74 years old, who I think was one of the first people to die in a Michigan facility for COVID-19. She was in prison for murdering her husband uh, decades ago and ended up dying in prison. And Allison Fonts from the Coalition for Public Safety highlighted Andrea Circle Bear's death, uh, who actually died being eight months pregnant got sent to, sent to prison and died having her child. And so how should we think about who should be making decisions about who stays and who goes? I mean, we talked about it essentially all the way up to, to what's happening with, with, the, with, with what's happening at the White House and the government. And then of course, we could think about things on a very local level. So if each of you could quickly before we close say, who should be making these decisions about who stays and who goes? Let's start with Mark, which is kind of my round robin. We'll go to Annalise, uh, Reverend Yeri and end with Marcus. Well, I'll just say quickly, you know, whoever has the authority to, uh, to release someone should be making that decision. In some places, that's the governor. Uh, in some places, that's a, a prosecutor weighing in. Judges should be stepping up as well as uh, parole commissions, right? So, so it, it, it varies in the situations, but everyone who's in a decision-making role should be looking very closely right now about how they can reduce the population, because right now people in jails and prisons are sitting ducks for COVID, and that's going to spread into our communities. It doesn't stay behind the walls. Yeah, good point. Annalise. I would echo that, and just in the interest of time, you know, the Byzantine governance is, is part of the problem here for crisis response, and I would add just that we also need to be thinking about if, you, if you're releasing people, making sure you're releasing them into safe conditions, and thinking about uh, <clears throat> protocols for that as well. We don't want homeless people, uh, people being released into homelessness. That's right. Reverend Year? Uh, I can't say it any better. Answer D, all of the above. Whomever uh, has the, the requisite authority, depending on where folks find themselves in the process, uh, should be uh, participating in it. And I think actually mm -hmm. prosecutors have a responsibility, even post conviction, to go in and make the appeal because they actually have state authority behind them. And so we have to make sure that we don't allow folks to stay in their comfortable silos and, and uh, skirt their, uh, their responsibility and also add community confinement as an option, right? So sometimes it's not a home uh, that's actually most available for us for this release, but sometimes community networks that allow us to rely on uh, a myriad of, of resources to be able to make sure that this transition is healthy, not just for the returning citizens, but also uh, for the communities that they're returning to. Marcus? Uh, 
And who am I to add to that? I mean, <laughs> they, they, they <laughs> knocked that one out of the park, right? Like, I mean, I, I mean, of course, I would probably, you know, because I'm a champion for, you know, I like to get on my soapbox and talk about um, uh, the need for eradicating some of these uh, laws around um, technical violations. So as we think about with probation, like not just like people getting released, right, but preventing pro folks from going into the jails today anyway, right? So pro technical violations, um, the police officers who are protect are there to protect my community. Um, having a little bit uh, of discernment around the folks that they're putting handcuffs on now and taking them down to these cells, right? They're locking them up and putting them in jails for no reason. I mean, not, not for no reason, right? But things that we probably should think twice about whether or not they should be, you know, go going into a uh, jail cell all this time. Yeah, thank you. Reverend Jackson, you want to take us out? Yeah, the lack of press coverage. The press has an obligation mm. to go behind the walls. The, the cost of, of imprisonment uh, I, remember, I remember in 83, we took Harold Washington. We go to Cook County Jail every Christmas Day. We took Harold Washington with us. Press really good. Harold, while you been in jail one time, you didn't pay your taxes. Spence Leak was a jail warden. We registered 9,000 inmates down both of Harold. He won by the margin of pre trial detainees. We wow. empowered them. I'm wow. submitting to you that the, the, the press they has, the press is negligent in not covering what's happening behind those walls in terms of. The ethics of it, the humanity of it, and 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 the, and the potential possibilities behind those walls. Mm. I think that's a great way to end. We want to thank everyone who was tuning in for this event. Um, again, I mentioned a series of questions. I think we got to a lot. One that really stuck with me is the question that that Mike asked about ICE uh, detainees and detention centers that we couldn't even get to. I think it deserves its own event in addition to some of the other things that people ask that we couldn't necessarily get to. But we want to thank all of you for tuning in. We want to thank all of our panelists for giving us a lot of information to think, you, think about and tune in for that June 5th event that Annalise will be doing on uh, on prison, on, on the prison to work pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rishon. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, everyone. It was awesome. Okay, I think we are good to go. Thank you all. This was uh, wonderful. Uh, well, let's hear what Letty has to say. Letty, was it good? I mean, oh, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Thank you everyone so much. We really appreciate your time, Reverend Jackson, all his team. Um, I thought the conversation was really fantastic. Obviously it's hard to kind of dive into everything in an hour, but I think you guys did a really good job. Um, the video should be up, I think.